Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. I'm John Graham, finance professor at Fuqua School of Business. Today, I'm going to talk about the CFO survey, or the Global Business Outlook is the more formal name. So let me uh, first go ahead and share my screen here so you can see some slides that I'll be talking about. Okay, so the Global Business Outlook, we've been doing this C survey of CFOs around the globe for 24 years now, so 96 consecutive quarters. Um, this most recent survey was probably the most remarkable survey we've ever done because we started the survey on March 3rd and ended it five weeks later on April 3rd. And through that time, you can see the effects of the coronavirus on the US and global economy week by week, and you'll see some pretty dramatic changes as I'll show you in just a moment. Um, I've actually talked to some CFOs after we closed the survey and they largely affirmed that what we find towards the, the end of the results are still holding today. And I'll, I'll lay that out for you soon. But we had 1400 CFOs from around the world participate this quarter. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but we have a lot of global partners in order to get the global reach of the survey. You can see them listed here on the slide. We also work closely with policymakers, one, to feed them our results, but two, sometimes to put questions they request on the survey. And the, the idea here is the policymakers want to get a sense of the pulse of the business outlook today, right, from the survey. Government statistics are great, but they're typically lagged, often by a quarter or more. And so this is a current outlook at the time the survey is conducted. As I'll talk about in more detail, for the most part, what we're doing is we're asking CFOs for their one year ahead forecasts, okay? All right, um, so going on, here's the overview, kind of the main takeaways from today. And by the way, if you have questions, you can, you can put them in the, uh, um, into the chat box and um, we'll, we'll get to those eventually. Some of them I might answer uh, as we go, but mostly we'll probably wait till the end. But here's the punchline. CFOs are as pessimistic now as they have ever been in the history of the survey, okay? They're as pessimistic now as they were at the depths of the Great Recession that happened in 2008, 2009. And as you'll see, um, the beginning of March, was, the things looked okay. But the sec starting in the second half of March, the bottom fell out. And that's when the optimism fell to an all-time low. So this mid-March inflection point, you'll see how dramatic that is shortly. Before I get any deeper into the survey, I don't wanna forget, and that's why I put it here on the slide, that next Wednesday at 12.30, Peter Ubel from Fuqua's uh, HSM Health Sector Management Group will talk about the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare systems and patient care, which is obviously a very important issue today. So back to, back to the CFO survey. You might ask yourself, why are we uh, doing a survey of CFOs, chief financial officers? You know, what do they know that other people don't know? Or what do we expect to learn from CFOs? Well, CFOs are the numbers people, okay? They know the company's business plan as well or better than anyone else in the company. And so for one thing, they can kind of recite the numbers off quickly off the top of their head as they participate in a survey. They don't have to do a lot of research. So it makes the survey easier for them. But much more importantly, it's an anonymous survey and the CFOs can more or less tell us what's in their business plan. And we don't know exactly which company is answering the survey because it's anonymous, but we can take a weighted average across companies and get a sense that the, on average, companies are planning to hire 3% more employees this year or a capital spending forecast. So again, CFOs, they know the business plans for the next year. We aggregate them, and that turns into the overall outlook from the perspective of CFOs, not just in the US, but in many other countries around the world, as I'll show you. Now, one of the questions we ask here in this chart you can see right now is how, optimistics, how optimistic are CFOs about the outlook of the, for the economy of their own country, okay? So here's some US data in the bottom right corner. And we have their optimism about the US economy down here, and that predicts the one year ahead unemployment rate. Not the current unemployment rate, but what the unemployment rate will be one year from now. 
And you can see if you remember your statistics, this is an outstanding statistical fit. OK, so optimism is a great predictor of future unemployment and likewise of, of aggregate earnings for the economy and GDP growth and many other variables. OK, so the forecast has a good history. It's pretty accurate. All right. So that previous graph, I was showing you how optimism predicted the unemployment rate. What is the optimism right now? So if you look at this top graph, we see the optimism of CFOs since 2005, OK? And yes, there's different regions of the world listed. And normally, I would spend some time trying to differentiate between, well, the US is more optimistic than CFOs in Africa and such. But this quarter, what just stands out is this last quarter where all around the world, optimism just fell off the shelf, OK? And optimism fell in many regions to an all-time low, and in the US to more or less a tie with, with the all-time low. And the, the, the previous all-time low was in 2009, the depths of the Great Recession. So that's all around the world. If you look at the graph here on the bottom, that's the optimism for the United States. The red line is optimism about your own firm's financial prospects. And the blue line is your optimism about the overall economy in the United States, OK? And again, the punchline here is optimism just plummeted in March. And in fact, as I'll show you in just a minute, in the middle of March is when it plummeted to uh, at or almost to an all time low, both at the firm level and the overall country level. And so um, that, that's a really important factor because optimism predicts, CFO optimism predicts the future pretty well. Now, why did optimism fall? Of course, it's because of the coronavirus that we're, we're all living through right now. Now, we were planning already to do this big elaborate survey. At the end, I might talk a little bit more about that, some of the nuts and bolts of corporate finance. So we were already planning to have this survey open for five months. And right as the, the launch date approached, all this coronavirus stuff was going on around in other parts of the world initially, but then it was starting to seep into the US. So at the last minute, I put this question on the survey, what do you assess as the financial risk to your company from coronavirus. And you can see on the left here, these are for different regions of the world. And to make an efficient discussion today, I'm going to focus on the US here in the blue, but you can see other regions. At the time, only about 42, 43% of US CFOs thought that, um, that they faced medium or large COVID-19 risk. Okay, That's before March 15th. After March 15th, and I'm talking over that weekend, immediately a drop or an increase, I should say, up to about 80% of companies saying they face medium to large coronavirus risk. Now, since the survey closed, we've gotten a little more data and that, yes, the risk is now deemed to be even higher than this, but it's in the ballparks. So this is very representative. And you can see this happened all around the world. So again, it happened quickly and it happened all around the world are two very unique features about what happened uh, this quarter. Now, what, what, what happened to optimism? Well, again, focusing on the US in blue, optimism was at about 58, which is a little below the long-term average of 60, OK? So before March 15th, things look a little bit worse than average, OK? Overnight, after March 15th, optimism fell down to approximately 40, which, again, is the all-time low in the US. And other regions of the world fell below their all-time low. OK, so it happened overnight. It fell dramatically to all time lows and it's all around the world. Other times we've had recessions, even in the Great Recession, it didn't hit everywhere all at once. So there was some part of the world that was still chugging along. That could, if you had exports there, maybe you were still pulling you, you, you along with it. That didn't ha It's not happening right now, at least not yet. Maybe as this starts to unwind, we'll see some regions start to do better than others. Um, as, as we come out of the, um, of the, the virus-induced recession. Here's the optimism about their company's own firms, OK? Um, all right, I'm, I'm seeing a question. And then the same thing happened here. It fell dramatically, fell around the world. Own firm optimism is a bit higher than about your own country. That's kind of normal. But the, the key here is that there's a fall. So I see a question about 
What about companies that have received money from through the government plan or perhaps even their own line of credit? Of course, that is important because right now financial flexibility is perhaps the most important thing that companies are thinking about. In other words, do we have enough cash to last for another few months or maybe longer? Um, so yes, getting the, the uh, money helps a lot, but even when I condition on that and, and, and look at the numbers, optimism is still very low. Yes, it's lower for firms that haven't recently tapped into funding, but it's still very low everywhere. Um, another question is, do I think we can extrapolate from the past experience into this recession? That's a fair question, right? If we went back to that little statistical regression line I showed you how amazingly good the fit is, it's possible this is so unique that it won't quite a fit on that same regression line, if you will. But my sense, I mean, you could have asked me the same question in the Great Recession, because that was the deepest recession since the Great Depression. And in fact, the, model, the CFOs performed pretty well then too. So, okay, we'll give them, we'll give some grain of salt here, take it with a grain of salt, but I still think we're directionally and in magnitude pretty close. Okay, so optimism fell. Now, so what? What else happens? Here's sales revenue, okay? In blue over here, before March 15th, US CFOs expected sales revenues to go up by about 4%. That's low, to be honest. So even though they were only a little bit below average on optimism, their sales forecast was rather weak. So they were already a little bit worried about the economy with that kind of number. But after March 15th, the number falls now to negative 1%, okay? So that's a, a drop, a pretty big drop in the US, five percentage points. And you can see without quoting exact numbers, even bigger drops in most regions of the world. So sales revenue forecast came down dramatically that's really important because most everything is kind of driven off of sales for most companies, at least. In other words, if sales come down, then everything else kind of comes down with it, including profits, hiring, capital spending, and everything else. Now, let me put a little bit of good, a slight good news interpretation into the mix here. Notice how this is minus 1%. Now, when the CFOs I've talked to in the last couple of weeks, it is a little lower than that, minus 2 or 3%. But again, it's sort of ballpark. Right now, as we stand here today talking, it's worse than minus two or 3% for most companies, right? Now this is a 12 month ahead forecast. So built into this implicitly is an expectation of a recovery, all right, over the next 12 months at some point. Maybe not a full recovery, but a recovery from where we are now, the low that we're currently at. Now, do we expect a sharp V recovery as people talk about, or a U, a longer drawn out recovery? Well, this I think is not a super sharp V, but it is more of a V than a U. In other words, a fairly reasonable recovery within 12 months. We won't be back to where we were before March 15th. We'll be basically treading water with our head a little bit below water still over the 12 month period. That doesn't sound great, but it's better than what, where we are today, right? So some recovery is built into these numbers. All right. Um, here's another look at the sales revenue forecast because sales revenues are, are quite important. Here again is the, the orangey number here. That's the minus 1%. That's the best guest forecast. Okay, so their most likely outcome, if you will. What we've got here in the blue is we also ask CFOs, tell us about your very bad scenario. I wrote bad just because I couldn't fit very bad on there. And by very bad, what we meant was um, 10 per, only 10% of the time will the forecast be this bad or worse? That's the way we ask the question. And you can see there that we, they expect a reduction in revenue, US CFOs, of minus 13 to minus 14% in the very bad scenario. If that happens, we're in a world of trouble, okay? So we have to hope that a very bad scenario doesn't happen. It's in the planning set, you know, the CFOs are considering but it would be very bad news. Maybe even more interesting actually is the gray bar here, the very good scenario. And by very good, what I mean is only 10% of the time do we expect the, the outcome to be this good or better, okay? And interestingly here, before March 15th and after March 15th, they're practically not different from each other. So there is still some, some element, only a 10% chance of, but some optimism out there 
that we could have that really sharp rebound. Of course, we'd all love that and think that's a great outcome. CFO is only assigned a 10% chance to it, but it is interesting to me that it wasn't that everything came down in lockstep, that really good scenario sort of hanging in there a little bit. Okay, let's move on. That was a lot on revenues. What about capital spending? Capital spending is important, okay? Coming out of the Great Recession, that is 10 or 12 years ago, it took a long time for hiring to get going, right? But business spending actually kicked in reasonably quickly, and that's really what pulled the U.S. out of recession. What are we seeing right now? Well, before March 15th, we thought that, that capital spending might go up by about 4% in the U.S. That's kind of a low number, to be honest, but at least it's positive. And it was, it was a, a lukewarm number. Now we're down to minus 2% and maybe even minus 3% from some numbers I've heard after the survey closed. So that's worrisome, right? We're not going to get the bang for the buck from the capital spending. Again, it's normal when revenues um, fall for this to happen, but, um, but that's not good news. Likewise, you see around the world, I mean, Africa here, in green is taking the most substantial hit. Um, take with a grain of salt the African numbers, because we only have about three or four dozen African companies participating in the survey. And I, I might not have said the number, but we have over approximately 500 in the US. So this number in Africa has a big um, uh, confidence band around it. But nonetheless, we see from a pretty healthy number that was going to be recovering from recessions that Africa was already coming out of. And now we're not, Africa's not coming out of it. It's only going to get a little worse. Okay, that's capital spending. Hiring plans. Um, here we see that in the US, companies were planning to hire three, maybe 4% more employees. That is really strong employment growth. That's very noteworthy because um, we had heard for years in a row the biggest problem companies were facing was hiring enough uh, new employees of the right skill set. To match the job opening, well, guess what? Unfortunately, now we're looking at a reduction of workforce. Now, of course, right now, unfortunately, many, many people have lost their job, much higher than this minus one or two percent we're seeing here. But that's building in the recovery. So again, to go to, to reinterpret, what we're saying is a year from now, we will have lost one to two percent of the um, workforce, which is unfortunate. But it's, it's a pretty decent recovery from where we are today. And again, you see that around the world, um, all, all, these, all these sorts of numbers. Okay, wages and salaries. Okay, darn, I was, I was counting on a pretty decent wage increase you know, this year. That's not going to happen. I mean, thankfully, we're still on average hearing a positive number, but it's basically going to be treading water. When the employment um, picture tightens up, uh, like it was before March 15th, and certainly earlier than that, wages typically go up. That's what we were experiencing. Now that it, um, the employment will be a lot looser, wages won't won't go up as much. And on top of that, companies are really facing right now the need to cut costs. And one of the things that they do is freeze wages, perhaps. Um, okay, I'm gonna let's see. I'll go. I'm gonna go to the summary. Before I summarize, I'll go to one other question. Um, well, actually, let me hold the question. I'll do the summary and then I'll come back to that question. If you have other questions, go ahead and send them in right now. CFOs are as pessimistic now as they were at the depths of the Great Recession. We saw that. There was this dramatic inflection point that happened almost overnight in terms of the attitude of CFOs about their business. Almost overnight, it was incredibly steep and it happened all around the world. Those are really three very unique things about what's happened. And as you saw, it affected all the plans about sales revenue, hiring, and capital spending. So right now, I'm going to actually come back to the video so you can see my face instead of the slides. Um, I think I need to stop sharing to do that. Um, and hopefully, my tech guy here got okay. He's got us. Let me come back over here. And I'm going to move things. Oops, sorry, move things around just a little bit so I. Huh, darn, I hid. Okay, here we go. I can read the questions. All right. So one question is, um, the you know what's this is summarized across all industries. Does the all, the results I've been saying hold across all industries? So we're all aware just from you know reading the news and paying attention. Um, there are some companies, Amazon, Netflix, Walmart, that are actually doing quite well right now. 
But as as far as the whole and whole industry goes, this is hitting across the board all industries. So if you look at optimism, there's a small variation, but everybody plummeted overnight. And likewise, yes, there are variations in hiring plans from the retail sector to say the tech sector. Tech sector is looking better than say retail, but across the board, the numbers got a lot worse. So kind of unfortunately, um, things do look pretty bad around the world. Okay, uh, the sales revenue number, what does that represent? Well, first, let me say one thing. If you go online to cfosurvey.org, you can see all of these numbers broken out by industry, okay? What we've done, like how, what industry are these representative of was a question I just got. We take a weighted average across companies and across revenues. We give big companies a bigger weight than small companies because if a big company lays off 5% of their workforce, it's more employees than a small company doing it. And so this is a weighted average across all industries. So it is an aggregate. But if you look online, you can see specific numbers by industry. And as I was just saying, they pretty much hold right now kind of across the board um, for, for uh, across industries. Although there's some variation on the hiring side. The spending is down everywhere. Optimism is down everywhere. Wages don't look so great everywhere. The hiring does vary a little bit by industry um, as you, you know, in kind of in intuitive ways right now the the retail and people facing businesses are um, have much worse employment numbers, but everybody else has come down also. So I can, uh, as I'm waiting for more questions, I'm gonna <clears throat> do one other thing here, share my screen again, just briefly. I, I mentioned that we were looking at, um, we were doing, I was doing this really big project that had nothing to do with the virus. And it's really more about how is the practice of corporate finance work today in the year 2020, okay? And sometime in the future, maybe I'll talk to you again, or at least you can look on my website and find a, a big long report on this. But um, one of the things I wanted to know is, hey, what we teach in corporate finance is companies, the goal of the firm is maximize shareholder wealth, okay? On the survey, we also ask about, do you follow the net present value rule? How do you decide how much dividends to pay? How do you calculate your cost of equity? All this bread and butter corporate finance. I'm only gonna talk about one thing right now, but this is a huge survey we conducted. I had the help of like 30 MBA students around uh, that were helping me, their current students as fantastic RAs, phone calling CFOs and getting them to participate. So one of the questions here is what's the goal of the firm? Should companies still try and strive to maximize shareholder value? Now, the last time I had the inkling to ask this question was in the middle of the Great Recession, where you'd read these newspaper articles and say, capitalism's dead, um, you know, it's not all about the shareholder anymore. So I thought, well, why don't we ask CFOs what their view is? And this was in 2010, you know, so 10 years ago. And at the time, in the blue here, we've got United States, red is Europe, gray is Asia on this chart. So what we saw was over on the far left, this would be maximized shareholder value. That's the only goal of the firm, okay? Over on the far right, that would be run your company for other stakeholders, not for shareholders. If you went to the, the very far right, it would be not for shareholders at all. And you can see that this was heavily tilted still at the time towards maximized shareholder value. The average on this scale was probably about 25. So three fourths leaning towards maximized shareholder value. So not having anything to do with the virus, but I decided to get an update on this number because lately we've heard a lot more about other stakeholders, the CEOs of the largest 100 companies, they all put a, you know, a statement out that it, they're not just about shareholders anymore, but they're about other stakeholders. And so when we run the same thing in 2020 today, and now we've got the US, Europe, Asia, and we've added Latin America and Africa, which we didn't have in 2010, around the world, you see now it's a much more even split. I probably should break these numbers out a little bit more. It still leans a little bit towards shareholder value, but now it's like 60-40 shareholder stakeholder split, okay? Whereas before it was 75 or 80% st stakeholders, uh, shareholders, excuse me. That is a big change. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if this shows up in other corporate policies and the way businesses are run. In fact, maybe how they're managing their way through their, the, the virus right now, you know, they're as worried about their employees perhaps 
as they are about shareholder value at this particular moment in time. Um, if you're wondering which stakeholders show up, you can see of those who said at least a 40% weight on stakeholders, of those folks, I asked the second question, and that is, which stakeholders are you talking about other than the stockholders? Employees and customers are the top two stakeholders. So again, it'll be very interesting to see how that changes the way companies make decisions. The environment, local community also showed up, but more on a second order level relative to the employees and customers. So again, uh, if you go to cfosurvey.org or just bug me in six months, um, I can share a lot more results with you on that. So let me stop sharing again, but most of what I've said today has been about, um, about the, the virus, but I wanted to share a little bit with you about this shareholder value thing. All right, let's see. Uh, great question. Someone asked about how many, what portion of the responses from Asia are in China, which of course, one, um, experienced the crisis more quickly than we, the rest of the world, but two, is coming out of it. The answer is only a small portion, unfortunately. It's actually very difficult to survey from outside of China into China and take the data out. And so we've had, we've been doing the survey for 24 years. There have been periods of time where we had a Chinese partner who could kind of do the work inside China and we would then report results. But now me trying to gather raw data from China is difficult. So there were, there is a small percentage from China. Uh, the numbers I show you were more dominated by Japan, to be honest, um, and India than by China. So that would be interesting. We do, there's a small number of Chinese responses, but I think too small to, to quote uh, too, too heavily. So that, that's a great question. All right. Well, I think, um, you know, let, unless I get any more questions, I think we're doing, we're doing pretty well here. And uh, I guess I'm going to sign off and say it's been nice spending time with you. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can shoot them my way. If you're a prospective student, oh, I meant to mention this a minute ago, um, that thing about capitalism, that question about shareholder value, Fuqua has actually introduced a new class to the curriculum now that studies that exact issue, kind of what is the role of traditional capitalism in today's business world? And it's kind of a cutting edge course that, again, has nothing really to do with the virus per se, but it's more about the business world today and where things are heading into the future. So I think that's a really exciting course that we've added. And I think those CFO survey numbers kind of um, supplement uh, what, where we're going with that kind of work. Well, good. I'll sign off and say it's been great uh, spending time with you and I hope you're all well and good luck to you over the next, the coming months. Thank you.